So thank you for uh, showing up for this session. Uh, I am Dr. Nikoi, and I'll be taking you through uh, session four, uh, looking at humankind and environment interactions. And we'll, this time we'll focus on influence of human societies. Uh, previously in session three, uh, we have looked at the concept of the environment and also uh, some of the component parts, the evolution of human societies. Um, what this session is going to do is try to look at uh, how human beings uh, have influenced this environment uh, that we've talked about in the previous session. So our objective for uh, this session is to explain uh, the influence of the environment on human societies. Uh, we will state the influence of uh, human societies on the environment and analyze human society environment in, uh, interactions. Okay. Now, if we uh, uh, look at uh, the interaction between human beings and the environment, um, there has been a debate that has raged over time uh, in terms of uh, which is it? Is it the environment that influences and constrains human uh, activity uh, in, in, in terms of the uh, environmental determinist argument, or is it human beings uh, who have the power of technology and the, 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 the mind to influence their environment, uh, which is what the argument posed by um, uh, the uh, possibilist or possibilism uh, in geography. Uh, well, what we will concentrate on today uh, will be to examine uh, the influence of human societies on the physical aspects of the environment and also uh, how human beings have influenced the vegetation, which is flora and animals, and then we'll summarize. Okay. Uh, much of this uh, session is drawn from uh, the first chapter of English uh, uh, on uh, pe uh, geography, people, and places in a changing world. Uh, so I would, uh, I would still encourage you to make sure you read uh, the assigned pages, uh, pages 31 and 32, it's not that much, uh, to get more information on uh, this session. So um, let's move on to look at the influences of human societies on the physical environment. Um, if you look at the pictures here, uh, it will tell you some of the influences that human societies have on, on the environment. Um, it, it includes influences on the landscape, um, people uh, digging um, for gold or for, for minerals, what has uh, come to be known as uh, Galamse in Ghana. Uh, but it's not just this. If you look at um, a mining in general, uh, it's part of the influences on the landscape. Uh, you see also here uh, instances in which you know, road networks will be cut into uh, mountainous surfaces. Uh, it's all examples of uh, influence on, on landforms. Uh, we'll also look at the influence of humans on water uh, bodies. Uh, sometimes we pollute them. Uh, sometimes we dig deep into it, uh, use it for transportation. Um, sometimes we harness water from these uh, water bodies for uh, consumption, for daily activities. Um, and then the other influence of human beings uh, is on the air. Okay, we look at questions of air quality um, and its impact on uh, and how human beings are able to influence the quality of the air around them. You know, much as we talk about the influence of, uh, of man on the physical uh, environment, uh, we see examples uh, like this where the environment is actually showing us where the power lies. 
you know, in a number of cases, people with, you know, big machines like this think they can overcome the environment. You know, in a number of cases, there'll be flood, and then people will want to drive their cars through the flood because they think they have acquired the ultimate capacity to overcome, you know, uh, such situations. Uh, this is where it sometimes ends you. Okay, so when we talk about landforms, uh, we are looking at uh, features like hills, uh, mountains, uh, we are looking at valleys, and uh, throughout uh, human history, uh, human beings have been trying to, you know, modify these things so that uh, it will make life a bit more comfortable. I mean, imagine uh, carrying uh, a lot of load up the Ebre Hill, you know, for example. Uh, that would uh, take a lot of energy to cut anything up there. Um, and so human beings, to lessen that burden, will try to, you know, modify that surface, make it a bit more gentle so that they can move goods and services uh, across space. Um, my, uh, human beings have also created uh, canals uh, for water transportation. Uh, they have also built harbors uh, so that they can connect with uh, different portions of, of the world um, and uh, engage in economic activities. Uh, sometimes um, some landforms are difficult to you know, tackle from the surface, so we would dig under uh, or through it uh, uh, and also create some um, features like subways, which are a common thing in places uh, like US and uh, Europe. Um, now examples of uh, canals that we can talk about include a Suez Canal, which uh, connects the Mediterranean uh, to the Red Sea uh, in Egypt. And uh, we also have the Panama Canal, um, which also uh, connects um, the Caribbean to the Pacific Ocean uh, to enable um, navigation in such a way that you know, shorter distances can be utilized instead of going uh, through long routes. Now we also, one of the other ways that uh, uh, human beings, you know, uh, tries to deal with landforms is to create uh, things like dikes uh, to, you know, uh, prevent uh, water from, you know, trespassing into uh, human settlements. And so uh, we would, uh, for example, if you, if you look at uh, places like Adafo or Cape Coast, uh, there are a lot of projects going on, sea defense walls, um, are going on to try and prevent the sea from taking over a lot of settlements. And uh, these are all ways in which human beings are trying to, you know, make life comfortable by interfering with the power of the environment. In fact, one of the uh, uh, tragedies that happened in the United States uh, was uh, Hurricane Katrina. Uh, where, you know, these dikes that were thought to be able to withstand the force of water, uh, you know, when it came to the test, couldn't stand up to it and caused a lot of uh, tragedy uh, in the United States. Now, uh, examples of, of uh, uh, dikes also include um, those that have been built along the uh, Nile River to uh, make sure that the Nile water, when it floods, occasionally uh, doesn't interfere with uh, you know, agricultural lands um, and, and human activities that are going on beyond the river. Wang Ho in China um, and also the Mississippi uh, River, uh, levees are along these uh, rivers is, have been you know, put in place by human beings as a way of preventing the force of nature or the unnatural environment from interfering with uh, human activities and in the process making life a bit more comfortable for, 
for human beings. Uh, the terraces are also uh, one of the ways in which uh, human beings try to, you know, uh, make changes or modify uh, mountain surfaces uh, to make it possible for uh, some activity to, to take place, usually agricultural activities. Um, a lot of these uh, terraces are, are much more prominent in East Asia uh, for agriculture. Uh, sometimes to, um, terraces will be cut into mountain surfaces uh, to enable uh, settlements to be built uh, along mountain surfaces. Um, I can think of the Makata Hill, for example, here in, in Accra, uh, where you know, people have built on these surfaces by cutting um, a terraces. It's believed that about 25% of China's total agricultural production uh, come from surfaces like that, uh, terraces that have been cut into mountain surfaces. I hope that we would be able to, you know, uh, go to places like, you know, Afajato, uh, and, you know, it sometimes depends on the technology available and also the human will uh, to do these things. And also the financing, uh, it's all part of uh, whether or not human beings will be able to uh, utilize these uh, ways of modifying the, the land form to their advantage. Uh, this is the Suez Canal. Um, it's a major, major uh, international shipping route. And in a number of cases, uh, when there is an international row, uh, some, uh, th these canals are sometimes uh, blocked uh, to prevent you know, movement of uh, goods and services. Now, apart from uh, the uh, shipping canals, uh, we also have irrigation canals, uh, which are usually constructed uh, to provide water to dry areas to enable agricultural activities to, to take place. Um, and then sometimes to, uh, human beings would, um, would construct drainage, drainage ditches. In cases where a place is found to be waterlogged um, and causing a lot of problems to, to human beings in terms of either the flooding of agricultural lands or flooding of uh, settlements, uh, these uh, drainage ditches are usually constructed to, you know, um, as it were, draw water from the waterlogged areas and therefore prevent flooding or damage, prevent damage uh, to human activities. Um, but not, you know, sometimes uh, not only do we mess with the landform uh, to create uh, uh, drainage uh, ditches, but we also, you know, would drill into the uh, earth to tap into uh, aquifers uh, so that we can draw the water for, uh, for use uh, in a lot of domestic and industrial uh, activities. Another way that uh, human beings try to um, modify their, uh, their water resources uh, is to uh, you know, widen channels uh, in cases where uh, they want to improve um, water navigation or sometimes dig deeper so that certain types of vessels can uh, you know, make use of these channels um, for uh, the movement of goods and services. That is another way that uh, human beings would, you know, influence uh, their water resources. Um, underground water, like I've already indicated, uh, is also tapped um, only after we have drilled uh, holes into uh, deep down into the earth uh, to make use of the water over there. You know, I have heard of commercials uh, where, you know, these pure water people would say, uh, we dig very deep into the earth's surface and draw, uh, you know, uncontaminated, very fresh uh, water 
uh, from, from the earth. Uh, it's all examples of how uh, human societies uh, have been influencing uh, landforms and, and the water resources that are available. In terms of air quality, um, you know, sometimes because of the industrial activities that human uh, societies engage in, um, you know, producing uh, various goods and services, a lot of the time the environment, uh, the, the quality of the air is polluted uh, by releasing dangerous gases uh, from these industries. Uh, not only that, um, we also pollute the environment uh, from you know, the use of transportation. Um, fossil fuels uh, uh, send a lot of uh, carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide uh, into the atmosphere and um, uh, through that we influence the quality of the air around us. Okay, so after talking about the uh, influence of human societies on landforms and water resources, uh, let's also look at, you know, our influence on vegetation and the animal stock. Now, in a lot of situations, uh, particularly if you live in uh, very poor societies, um, they would hunt out a certain species and, and by so doing, uh, put them into extinction. And so, um, part of the way we uh, human societies uh, influence the fauna is by you know uh, using these things or sometimes replacing them. You know we can make laws. Uh, for example, there are laws against uh, elephant poaching, um, so that we can you know uh, protect these animals uh, from uh, extinction. And so what you realize is that not our influence is both uh, positive and negative. Not only are we using uh, too much of the animal resources and therefore putting some into extinction, but sometimes when human societies realize uh, the destructive effect, uh, they put in corrective measures. We, we see uh, instances in which the uh, countries like the United States and China uh, would collaborate on saving the panda population, for example. And so, in some instances, human societies deplete the animal resources. In other instances, uh, they play a restorative role uh, so that depleting uh, animal resources are restored back to uh, what would be considered uh, a sustainable uh, level. In fact, one of the uh, significant changes uh, that human beings have done to the environment is seen from um, you know, interference with the vegetation. So uh, we have uh, things like agricultural activities, uh, lumbering, and also grazing uh, on grasslands uh, that have all you know, contributed in one way or the other uh, to uh, human beings' in, uh, influence on vegetation. Uh, sometimes in, in agriculture, um, particularly in developing societies, uh, you have you know, the practice, agricultural practices like slash and burn um, that would you know, destroy a lot of uh, vegetation because in a lot of instances, um, unintended uh, uh, vegetation is burned um, for agricultural purposes and um, that adds to our influence, our negative influence on vegetation. Uh, in terms of lumbering, we all live in houses. Uh, we use tables and chairs in our homes. Um, so uh, in, in a lot of ways, we have to cut um, you know, wood uh, to be able to get these things done. And that, in that way, we are influencing um, the vegetation. Uh, animal grazing, um, you know, if you are living in a more pastoral society, uh, then 
you have more animals grazing on marginal lands and by that you would influence the vegetative cover. All right. Now, if the last slide was about the negative influence, uh, this is about some of the positive uh, influences that human beings have on the environment. From time to time, there will be campaigns of, you know, afforestation or reafforestation, um, and you know, a lot of money is sometimes, you know, thrown at these things to make sure that human beings are not depleting the uh, vegetative cover and therefore, you know, creating uh, consequences like uh, the depletion of the ozone layer or, you know, climate change uh, that has uh, a knock-on effect on, you know, uh, human societies. So uh, encouragement is often made for, you know, planting trees and uh, grasses. And, you know, in a lot of cases, uh, these are stressed by developed countries. You know, the effort is geared towards developing countries. What we can uh, uh, learn from this is that, you know, in a lot of the situation, developed countries have, you know, the resources to uh, make sure that developing countries are not depleting their environment too much. The interest here is that, you know, uh, if you throw, um, uh, you know, gases into the atmosphere and pollute the atmosphere, uh, you cannot ensure that this gas just stays in one area. And so encouraging um, afforestation in developing countries is one of the ways uh, that uh, the developing countries think they can, you know, you know help the environment and um, maybe in, in some ways uh, sink a lot of carbon, the creation of a lot of plantations. Okay, then we also modify the environment um, uh, through the use of fire. Uh, bushfires have, uh, in a lot of cases, uh, gutted a lot of vegetation. Um, and in, in the 1983, uh, when we had a lot of uh, bushfires, it was associated with uh, the farming uh, that was going on at the time. Um, people would go and poach animals uh, and in the process, you know, leave um, uh, fires all over the place. Now. The drainage of swamps uh, is another way that we impact vegetation. Um, and the connection here is this, uh, that you know, too much water in any, uh, any area uh, is capable of killing uh, uh, plants and animals in that place. Uh, and if you look at the um, the Lake Volta, for example, uh, it's believed that the building of the dam, you know, uh, left excess water that, you know, flooded a lot of uh, vegetation and over time killed all uh, the plants in that place. Uh, and so leaving, um, you know, swamps uh, in some uh, places can lead to the killing of uh, a lot of vegetation. Uh, that is not to say that, you know, waterlogged places are not also places of opportunity for, you know, rice uh, production, for example. Uh, but if water is found in the wrong place, it has the tendency or the potential to uh, kill uh, vegetation that way. Now, we can also introduce new species. Uh, of plants into new environments, uh, and in that way, you know, um, help save uh, vegetation or help produce a new uh, vegetation in places that they uh, that didn't used to have them. The, the Kwashi's import of a cocoa bean uh, into Ghana, for example, has created a whole new uh, vegetation. Uh, in, in Ghana that didn't used to exist uh, before. So we can introduce uh, vegetation into new uh, areas. Uh, also, surface mining 
apart from taking uh, vegetation uh, from the surface, there are laws to say that once the uh, mining is over, uh, that they reafforest the lands that have been uh, impacted. Now, urbanization is one way uh, that we negatively impact the vegetation um, because the expansion of human settlement uh, means that uh, previously uh, areas that were not uh, used for, um, for building settlements would now be subject to uh, building and that means that the vegetation in those places would have to be cleared. Uh, more uh, vegetation would have to be uh, taken down for the wood uh, to be used for uh, building houses for the expanding population. One uh, question that we can ask from uh, everything that we've talked about so far uh, is what the negative effects of man's attempt to overcome the fiscal environment are. Okay. Uh, what we have seen from uh, the discussion in this session is that the impact is not all negative. Uh, there are some positive aspects uh, and there are some negative aspects. And you could be asked to elaborate on the negative aspects of human's influence on the environment. So in summary, um, we have looked at human societies and the significant effect that uh, we have on the physical uh, environment. And we have also said that this uh, effect can be both positive and negative, uh, affecting plants and animals in the environment. So uh, these are, uh, I, I want to re uh, reiterate the reference that I mentioned earlier on uh, look at it, it will give you more information, uh, clarify issues for you, uh, and you can contact me later on if you have any questions uh, regarding this presentation. Thank you.